<laughs> episode 10. Um, it seems like it took a long time to get to episode 10. Of course, the three of us, the normal D series guys, and we got Justin Hollinsworth. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Hey, Justin. How you doing, man? Welcome to the podcast. You're good, the good. best ever on the DeQuisto series podcast. I appreciate you guys having me. Yeah, you seem really excited to be here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what's up? Yeah. What's up, Andre? What's up, Cody? How you guys doing? Uh, good, good. Um, hanging in there. Surviving, man. Just I can't wait to see you guys' faces in person again next time we do the podcast, but uh, this is how it's going to have to work. Yeah. It's a uh, little redneck quality for us. Um, I always say on Working Class that we are hunters first, and I'm a podcaster second. So any low-quality anything, that that's what it is. We're all deer hunters and not nerds. So I think it looks. I think it looks good. I think we got some. We got some video aspect to this. We got some overlays to talk about what we're going to talk about today. Yep. And uh, I guess brief overview. Like I said, we got Justin Hollingsworth. Uh, he's a staff coordinator for Whitetail Addictions, co-producer for Whitetail Addictions. Um, does a lot of work with the Lone Wolf Custom Gear Pro staff. Um, we're going to dive in uh, to Whitetail Addictions this episode. We're going to talk about the history of it, what it is, uh, its its comeback, and you know what you can expect from it. And we're also going to dive into some you know self filming tactics and um, you know for all you guys who are looking into getting into capturing your hunts on film, uh, I think we'll have some good information for that too. So uh, it's exciting. First guest. Second. Second yep, guess? Brad was the oh, first. Yes. Yep. Right. <laughs> that was a test. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. White Tail Dictions. Uh, obviously, I'm going to let him explain a little bit, but I uh, was watching some of the old episodes this week, and I just wanted to mention, uh, it just so happened, I was watching Jared Erdotti's old film the other day, and I, I'm going to have to tell you, I, I had tears coming out of my eyes. You probably heard already his dad passed on. And I was, for just some reason, within a day, I was watching that interview of him talking about his old man. And I'm telling you, it was uh, it was the powerful stuff. So, um, Jared, you know, we're all with you. Uh, just wanted to put a shout out to you. Yeah, Jared's been a longtime friend of all of ours. And, and unfortunately, his dad just went through uh, uh, the whole coronavirus. And that's what he ended up passing away from. I hate to start it off as such a somber deal, but I thought I would just get that out of the way because it was just for sure. at me. So. So, Justin, I suppose we can tell you can tell your story of when uh, where you started. You actually were a uh, hunter just starting out, and you applied to be a part of the the show. Yeah, yeah. So, originally, how Andre and I had met was was uh, I'd called in, um, and I, I called in to he, he had lone wolf portable tree stands at the time, and I'd called in. We were I was we were talking about. I was buying a, a stand or sticks or something along the lines and over several different conversations, um, we would always end up talking about tactics and so on and so forth. And he said, Hey, he said, we're going to start a, uh, a TV show and it's kind of based upon all, you know, guys like yourselves, you know, do it yourselfers. And we're all going to be self-filming. And he's like, you, you know, you film your hunts. I said, no, I literally went out that week and bought a, a video camera <laughs> and started running around filming a little bit. And, um, and that was 16 years ago now. Can't believe it, man. Long. Um, and I've never put that camera down since that day. I've had that camera with me. I don't think I've, I don't think I've been, I don't think I've bow hunted without that camera um, since then. That's come in. Kind of gets addicting, you know? I mean, it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's weird. It's definitely something you get used to. And um, that's funny. You guys say that because I, I don't feel that way. I feel like, I feel like hauling the camera is like a complete pain in the ass. It is. and I and I used to film all my stuff, and I got burnt out on it, and I yeah. quit doing it. And I yeah. tried to just enjoy the hunt and not be so worried, like living in the moment, not be so worried about getting it on film. But then that's where, you know, I, I thought Justin was like, "Oh yeah, dude, send your hunts in from this year." I'm like, "Yeah, I didn't film them." And you're, I remember you being like, <laughs> "You didn't film those?" I'm like, "No, oh, man, I I just haven't been bringing a camera with me because my camera arm's a big clunky son of a gun, and I hate toting it around. It's annoying." Um, and you know what? And I get that because it, packing all that 
that stuff every single time. It gets to be, especially after you've had, you know, a month, month and a half, and you still don't got your deer around, you know, your deer down, and now you're trying to pack all this crap in. After a while, you start thinking. Justin, your your pack is, is ridiculous. It is. <laughs> it is. <laughs> How about a how about a slow week? Where you're not even seeing anything, and you're just going through, setting up every day, tearing down, and just not even getting any video footage. Just uh, it's a lot of work. And my hat, uh, the tip to all these guys that are doing it. Um, until you've been in it and you delved in it, and you're in it to get the job done, you're going to see it's a lot of hard work. And what, hunting big whitetails already a lot of hard work. So you throw that camera in the in the game, and you're um, man, it's a it's a tough deal. So. Yeah. It, my, when I filmed, it cost me a couple bucks and it just, the pain in the ass factor. I got some kills on film and some cool stuff, you know, and if, a, a lot of stuff that I cherish that like wasn't just deer kills or anything on film, just cool stuff that I saw was cool to film. But with the new camera arm, that's going to get me back into it because I don't, I'm not taking apart this big clunky thing and have to cram it in my pack with all my other stuff. And now I can just slide it in the side pocket on my pack. So I am looking forward to getting the camera back out and getting to just record all my experiences so maybe maybe i'll be on the show maybe i won't we'll see hopefully. no you're gonna be on the show this year i hope you're right hopefully with yeah, a bear we start, we start talking about horror stories you put the camera guy with him justin some of you smokes coughs and uh <laughs> all kinds of stuff, I don't know, somebody doesn't i got a couple phone. of those buddies i can send that way nah i know enough of those guys well i had a i'm not gonna say who it was uh but it's a good friend of mine who got so frustrated the first year cost him some of the biggest bucks he's ever had an opportunity in life and literally threw his fricking camera out of the tree and <laughs> I quit. So uh, I think he's coming back this year. He's going to give him another shot. So, <laughs> Dude, if we started talking about horror stories of self-filming, uh -oh. I don't think anybody listening to this episode would ever pick up a camera. Like it's just, no, it's a, it's a, it's a real, it's a real peach. Real, so, um, let me but, but here's the thing. Every time that I've never, like there's been times where, you know, the deer got behind me and I just elected to go ahead and shoot the buck or something, something had worked out along the lines where I didn't get it on video. Mm -hmm. Then to me personally, that sucks because I want, I want that memory. Right. I want to be able to go back and I don't, you know, it's not about a TV show or anything like that. It's just, you know, uh, just for my own personal you know, memories to go back and kind of relive stuff. And there's been times where I've went back and watched footage and say it wasn't on a, maybe it wasn't a kill shot or something like that. Maybe I just videoed a buck and I'd brought it back and I watched it that night and I'd said, Oh, you know what? I didn't notice him doing that, you know, or, or picked up on something and made the move the following day and killed the buck. Yeah. That's a unique perspective on it that you wouldn't realize until you had that footage and, and played back on it. So, you you got into whitetail addictions just by getting a hold of Andre, like by random. Yep. Randomly calling there and kind of, and we just kind of struck up a friendship that way and started talking about it. And then shortly after that is when um, we did the first whitetail addictions video training. Mm -hmm. And um, we had all met, we all met in Illinois. So what year this, is this? What year yeah. did all this go down? I, I think, I think to rewind just a bit, this is, it's all ass backwards. So, well, first of all, I mean, maybe it'd be a good idea. Like, okay, so l let's talk about what Whitetail Addictions is, right? Yeah, there you go. So, Whitetail Addictions, I think, started in 2006, correct? Somewhere in around there, yeah. Okay, yeah. well, uh, around that time. Somewhere. At this point in time, there was no there was no hunting program. All the hunting programs were focused around celebrity couples or celebrities themselves or, I guess, higher name individuals and and – you know, and, and they were what they were. I mean, you had you had some that kind of delved off that a little bit, but there was, I think dad seen a niche to, to showcase the average person. Like, so have a show that did not have a host. It did not have a one personality. It did not have a celebrity. And what it really did was it took you through an individual's, um, like different walks of life. And it showcased how, somebody who is a cop in Pennsylvania and somebody who's a, you know, lumberjack in, in Idaho could both be addicted to the same sport and it rules both their lives. And it was just kind of a, it was a really cool concept for a show program because it, it made the average guy the star. So it was really cool. So with that being said, I mean, I remember at this time 
I was just getting into hunting. And so the feelers were put out and it was like, Hey, if you're out there, if you're filming your hunts, if you're addicted to hunting whitetails, like we are, send us your footage. So it was like this, it, it was cool because I remember sitting at the house with, uh, you know, and this was actually when, uh, like everybody was courting on mini DVs. We had like this little mini DV player that was sitting on the, the coffee table and we had to like pop the tape in and we were just, we were like watching submissions. And I remember actually watching Justin's submission along with, I mean, and this was when I was so green at that point in time, but like, it was cool seeing a bunch of different people and watching interviews and just from the outside looking in like, Oh, this is an awesome concept. So, um, so that's kind of, yeah, the universe. So I'm going to say something, Justin, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to throw you under the bus, but so the other crow producer, oh. <laughs> we watched your video and he said, absolutely not. Yep. He says, dude, I don't know what you're missing, but I'm seeing something there. This guy just went out and got a camera. Look at the caliber of buck he's got down. I mean, this guy is committed. And I overrode that decision, and it was probably one of the best decisions I made because this guy has been putting out for how many years did you say now? I mean, year after year after year. So um, I wasn't a big video guy, but I was a hunter. And I, like I said, I seen, I seen something there, and I, and I, uh, and I went for it. And I, and I think I made it, obviously made the right decision, but um, uh, the other guy might be <laughs> – <laughs> uh, that's not too good of a decision. You know, it's like missing out on investing in Walmart at the at the get, beginning of it. So, but you know what? We had a bunch of really good guys, and a lot of the guys are yeah. still with us today. You know, still still doing it, and and some of them went uh, went on and done you know some other shows and stuff like that. And you know, we're still friends yeah, with a lot of those guys too. Launched, I think it launched a few careers actually in the uh, in the industry. So so yeah, we got for sure beginners to super serious serious hunters. Uh, all aspects and what we're doing now, what we want to do is with these new guys going up, you don't need real high end cameras. Uh, we're not claiming to be experts. Some guys will be filming with their cell phones, small little mini cameras. Even some guys will be using those, uh, uh, I don't know, maybe a Technicam or a, uh, a GoPro. Um, just get out there and start doing it. And some of these guys are going to, are going to fly with it, are going to be good and talented at it and, and take off. And other guys will get frustrated. But you mentioned about, um, a lot of times maybe seeing a buck and then not getting on a video. So I kind of came in a different aspect. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. I would not even shoot a buck unless I was trying to get it on tape because that's what, what my goal was at the time. So uh, short story is when, uh, so Adam co-produced that. And he, when we first started the show, he was the first guy that's ever I allowed in a tree stand with me to hunt. And he came and filmed, Right. So we were out at one at the lease in Illinois, actually. Sun coming up, and he's setting up, and he's got the camera, and I'm hearing a little clicking and clanking. I'm like, <laughs> I'm looking, and I'm like, this ain't gonna freaking work. And that's where the first strong arm design came in. In two days, I went back to the shop, chopped up a bunch of aluminum sticks, and I made him a a mobile, small, lightweight, quiet um, filming arm. And he started filming with that, and that's. 12 years ago. And that thing has you know, evolved since then. So this pocket arm you see now, uh, if anybody wants to try to make something easier, more compact, lightweight, have had it. But when you start filming with that and it's not a big pain in the ass anymore, you won't mind filming. You won't mind carrying around, uh, you know, you're already carrying a cell phone in your pocket. So um, you could really be set up and filming um, for a little, no, you know, little money and little headache. So well, and that's a big thing too. Like nowadays, uh, your average cell phone has awesome video capability. These 4K. these handy cams, yep. you know, these handy cams are are so tiny, and they they full in or they film in uh, full HD. Uh, and it's just it's not like before. Like around that time, when you wanted to get into it, like you had to get like a GL2 or something or like a bigger bodied camera. And it was a lot, it was a lot. And that's what I started filming with. What well, was a GL2 and they're huge. And then you had the mini DVDs and I mean, and, and uh, I remember even that first year, I mean, it, it got dirty inside. I had a send it in yeah. Canon. I had a bunch of problems with it. And, well, look how the my camera to show how small my setup was going to be this year. But I mean, if someone hasn't seen the camera arm, I mean, that's, it's not even there when you turn it sideways <laughs> and it's solid as a rock. So yeah, Justin, you mentioned about that size camera. Look at where cameras even went to from when we started 
big TV boxes up there. Oh, they're huge. Here. They That's started coming down smaller and smaller, and now they're uh, price you get about a pound camera that fits in your pocket. So it's um, it's, you'll 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 be surprised that when you see Troy Pottinger's episode this year, yeah, he filmed that all with us all with his cell phone. Oh, all right. And you ought to see the quality of the footage. Yeah, good. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, you can crank your like your iPhone up to a 4K, and it's better. I mean, my camera that I plan on putting on the camera arm doesn't even go. It does 1080, but it's not 4K. So it just shows you how compact and just advanced things are. It's just it's easier to get it done now, um, which mm-hmm. is great. You know, I guess I should have been filming last season, but I just didn't want to have to worry about it. But now I'm looking forward to. I'm actually I'm taking this to Wyoming in a month to film oh, uh, a bear yeah. hunt. Yeah, that'll be cool. So we'll see. We're going to have the stands on our backs more, and horses and all that. Yeah, you could be on a more fixed situation where you can just pan it back and leave it and not have to, to worry about much of the camera then, you know. so. Yep. And Cody made the, po- the point about <laughs> my backpack. Dude, I'm sick of that backpack. I'm <laughs> sick of packing that big thing around. That's why when you guys, when I was getting a little glimpse of this this camera arm, I was I – was, I was telling your dad, I was like, just send me one. Like, I'm not going to do, I just want to film with the freaking thing. You know, I'm just, I'm just tired of packing this great big giant arm around all the time. You know, that's why, that's why I had to start doing CrossFit this year. So I could pack my camera arm around. Dude, I'm telling you, we were when I'm out of state, we were out of state and I, I thought he had a, like a bin of his hunting clothes on the, on the tailgate of his truck. <laughs> I'm like, oh, he's, hey, he's got to get dressed. And then he slings that thing over his shoulder and heads in. I'm like, no fucking way! Like that's his that's his actual bag. He's oh, yeah. That and then combined, and then you got Josh over there with that bazooka arm he had, and he had an extra bag for it. His camera, <laughs> yeah. his camera is this big, like the size of the the lens on <laughs> my glasses, and he's carrying around an arm that could hold up a Sherman like tank, and it's got like and I'm. <laughs> what arm is that? I think it's the old, like the original muddy, like when 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 it came out. Um, and it's got the giant like crank rat, like literally there's a ratchet with that thing that you see. Oh, that big twin stuff. Yeah. I have that same um, camera arm. That's oh, the ca- other camera arm I have. Quit. It's, it's like, it's like a cargo tie down. That's probably rated for like the haul. Like, I, I don't even know. Yeah. Just the mount on my, whatever muddy model camera arm I had that I used before. And the, one of the reasons why I quit the, just the mount that, just the mount that went to the tree was probably three of these. Yeah. And just the mount, that's not the arm. And then the arm then, slides into that. Yes. The arm dropped in. It had actually yep. a, a, a one rod that dropped in mm-hmm. and it was solid, like two by four steel tubing, yep. like vertical way. So like you ain't getting, <laughs> I mean, you're not getting any slack. Like from that baby. Well, yeah, I mean, that's – exactly. That's – you could. You could definitely I didn't know because I wasn't familiar with all those really big arms, but somebody did call and thank me. I said, you, you saved me six and a half pounds on my camera arm this year. And I'm like, what <laughs> the hell are you carrying around, you know? So it must have been one of those. But, but. And I don't know. I mean, I think it, it's – it only seems – it only makes sense because everything is gearing down and people want to take less stuff and be more efficient. So, I mean, get a smaller pack. I mean, like this – this thing you can literally slide in your pocket. So, I mean, it's, it, it's going to help. I want to ask you, do you think that is because, I mean, guys like us have always done the mobile hunting thing, but now it's become a mainstream type of thing lately, the mobile hunting, the uh, going, going in, hanging hunts. And I think that's why we're seeing a lot of change in just the size of equipment. I mean, you guys have always been on the forefront of the innovation of it, but that's going to change the whole way the hunting industry does camera arms and stands and sticks and all that are going to follow your guys's lead because you guys live that type of hunting where it seems like the masses of people are just finally catching up to the effectiveness of it. Well, just, just like the, the DeQuisto series hang on essentially stemmed from a grinded down, like original lone wolf with a, you know, this component, that component. I mean, it it was essentially a, a modded out stand idea this camera, like I actually, I look back and I look at how long we, what, what was that? Six years, seven years ago, we modified our, our strong arms with those, with those bolts. Yeah, started we've, been, we've been running around for six or seven years with a camera 
that was maybe just a little, well, it was one inch square tubing. So it had a little bigger profile than that. And it had a little bit larger of a base. Um, but it was the exact, it was that, it was that arm essentially. It was, you know, well, so I th- excuse me. So Justin could probably speak to that. Now remember now we go out four months out of the year. We're not like your average guy. So we're, we're out hunting every day of the whole season, morning and evening. Imagine having to pack the equipment out and set it up. You've done it, Justin. You've been doing it with the heavy stuff. It is a lot of work, and I can see where guys can get frustrated with it. So the easier, you know, we're just trying to make it easy on ourselves because there's a lot of work for us too. To, to do that this this arm is going to make my life much, much better because I've been packing all this heavy stuff around. Uh, the, uh, the arm that I've been using for the last two years, it's got this gigantic, huge base. It's just, it, it's hard to get on, you know, it's hard to get on. It's hard to get level. And it's, and it, and it basically, it comes in three pieces. It's got a tool for, and it's got a tool that you got to use to level the thing out once you get it in there. So basically I'm carrying three different pieces to the woods now with this. And now it's shrunk everything down. And even with, I put a man off road ahead on top of it, it's 2.8 pounds. So we're working on a, I mean, a micro that's, now too. That's two ounces. So when that comes along, you put oh a God. In there. You are going to be carrying around under two pounds of equipment to film with. So I'm excited about that because I want to be lean and mean, you know. So well, yeah. so as a listener, as a I guess a, a listener, a viewer of Whitetail Addictions and all that, and looking back, like I have all the old DVDs and stuff like that, seeing what it was. And so, how long did it run for? You started in '06 ish in that time frame. How many years did it run for? How many how many DVDs do we have on that? Was there left? I think four. it was four seasons. No, there was, a, was a, there was a five for sure. Okay. I thought, well, yeah, because then we had a five uh, a, a few a few li- a years later after that too. Yeah, the okay. show really had traction. Some other shows started trying to you know maybe mimicking it. We weren't really um, connected in the industry. And what happened is uh, we had paid for a whole year of uh, airtime on a TV show one year, and the the, the TV um, company went out of business and basically stuck us we were just you could just see the show was just starting to take off really big time and then boom we got the uh, rug pulled out from under us the uh, actual station went out of business and we only got through i think just under a half of uh um of the, of the shows that were made so then we we kind of called our quits you know i retired went out uh, to iowa i actually stopped filming for a while uh messed around with a cell cam you know with the cell phone and stuff like that and now, you know, we, we're getting back in these products. And then, uh, you know, Justin has still been filming. I think you were filming for a few other, helping some other shows out. And so was Heath and a few other guys. And when, when I told him we were, you know, going to bring this back, all the guys said, man, I'm, matter of fact, some guys gave their walking papers to uh, uh, some of the other shows they were working on. I said, I'm in, and we're all back. So we got a ton of the old guys coming on. Uh, Justin's, uh, going through some new talent that we've seen going through interviews and things of that nature. So I'm excited. I've been watching the old ones that are on YouTube right now. And I forgot just how good and intense they were. And now I'm getting to see some of these rough cuts in the new ones. Like I, I seen, uh, Troy's modern day mountain man. I'm like, man, that is just, uh, just the, the, um, the relationship between him and his son hunting it's phenomenal stuff. So, uh, and guess and what? We get, it's all free. We get, so. And we got some killer stories. I think, I mean, and then the quality of bucks too that we shot this year. Yeah. I think there was uh, t- uh, there was two two hundred inch deer. There was a one ninety. I'm, um, I mean, there's some really really good deer. I think we averaged. I think the average buck was like one fifty eight for for the year. That's impressive on, uh, for a whole team of people. Yeah, yeah, and all and all self films except for Troy. Troy filmed his son Tyson, which was an, it's an awesome hunt. I can't wait to can't wait to show well, let's it. Talk about where people can watch it. I know it for some it's obvious, but if people have no clue, where can they find it? Yeah, we're gonna have it on the Lone Wolf Custom Gear site, uh, the YouTube channel, and yeah, that's where we've been airing everything so far. The old ones, anyways. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. Uh, Lone Wolf Custom Gear YouTube page will have a you know a Whitetail Addictions playlist right right on there, so you can watch. Um, watch right through the through the site there we're so. trying to set that area up so you can get the podcast all the all the media um things that we're going to have in there a guy can just come on to the uh the site and and have access to all of it so perfect perfect so when i know you know with custom gear hitting the scene and all that that got everybody fired up to get addictions going again 
Um, Justin, were you just sitting there just waiting for it to fire back up or how did that pan out? I can see you. Just I've been like, waiting for this, this to happen point. for a while. <laughs> I've been chomping at the book. I've been chomp. I've been chomping at the bit for a while to, we had it going once before, like we did those three or four seasons and we brought it back for a season. And then, um, and, but now I feel like, you know, Byron Horton is, he's the main producer and me and Heath Cisco are the co-producers. And I think collectively, I think this is the best stuff that we've, that white television has, has ever done. Uh, the quality of the foot, you know, just for a self filming footage. I mean, that's good. That's, yeah, I, I can't, I really can't wait for them to get up, get up and running. Um, and a lot of guys I've been talking to too said, I have your DVD and I literally wore out like two of them. I've been just watching reruns and reruns over it when I heard that some new ones coming out. Uh, there's a lot of people pretty, pretty pumped on. Um, um, well, I'll say, you know, when White Tail Editions came out and when that whole thing started for me personally at that time, it White Tail Addictions kind of changed my life, really. Because, you know, I went from just, just an everyday guy going out there bow hunting doing this and that whatever and when especially after that first season had came out and then just you know getting around all the guys and you know meeting everybody and everything else like after that it just lit a fire under me like it, it you know, almost makes you step your game up eh? i mean it, it almost it does it you does know, you're seeing what other guys are doing and then you're thinking you know you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna go out of state this year. I'm gonna I'm gonna go after a bigger buck. Or you can just see the guys are all um, just bringing their A game to the to the show this year. So that's cool. Yeah, when you get a community of people that are all trying to do the same thing and and, and do better from that, it, it kind of motivates you to do that as well. I know one of my really good friends is on the crew, Austin Chandler, and he actually has an episode coming out, which I haven't watched it yet. But it's just kind of cool that one of my good buddies through the podcast and, and meeting Cody that he got on to be on the team. So it, it's kind of neat to see yeah, how Austin's like is really good. Yeah. I've seen his, like his too. And you know, he reminds me of, you know, so we had a, a buddy of mine, big Jim Deppy farmer, they called him. Uh, he's getting a little up in age here and he's not doing film anymore, but it looks like almost now the next generation, he's a you know fourth generation farmer, but Chandler's is similar type of taste, but just, you know, 12 years later. So it's, it's weird that, uh, to watch the old one with him and then see the new, uh, young guy coming up and, um, phenomenal hunter too. Um, seems to be a real, real part. I think, I think we're going to see some good stuff coming out of him in the future. Yeah. yeah he's he's killed kill some whoppers. Yeah. He doesn't, uh, he doesn't just go to the woods to go to the woods. He's got a, a mission on his mind every time. So it, it's pretty cool. Awesome. You guys are on the staff, like just in general. Yeah. Uh, he's Cisco from Ohio. Um, he, um, he killed two bucks last year, one Ohio, one in Illinois, killed a whopper in Illinois and, uh, Matt Ellison, he's from Iowa. He's been part of it from, from the start of it. Oh, yeah. uh, he's got a couple really good kills. Um, uh, Alan bliss, um, Alan's been with us from the start. Um, who else we got? Mike Grenier, Mike killed a. 190 plus this year giant deer that he'd been following for a couple years um troy pottinger and his son tyson out in idaho they're uh they're out there hunting the the big woods of idaho and run around and you know the public uh public land of of idaho and washington that's something you don't Um, see a whole lot i know watching no western type shows he's mentioning some uh so a few guys let's those are all success stories, but this whitetail addiction is a real deal. You know, it's uh, not high fence. So let's talk about Alan Bliss and um, Todd this year. Meyer, phenomenal footage, stepping up their game. I mean, they could have all probably shot, you know, 150 class animals, and they were they just hanging out and holding out. Uh, and you'll see probably in uh, Alan's, you know, show he's he close to seeing a deal on a 170, but stuff happens, man. It's, it's part of the game. Thing wigged out. And you end up with no deer for the year, but you know what? Uh, a season like that, a lot of guys would love to have been in that seat and seeing the, some of the ones they passed. And um, uh, that's a that's a part of the journey, the trail of, of this deal. You know, you're not always going to be successful, um, but you try your hardest, and you still can end up with some great footage and um, uh, a good year. Or so, oh, that's a that's the thing. I think a, the guys on this staff, I mean, we're shooting, you know, some really 
you know, high quality bucks. I mean, so, I mean, you're going to have times where you're not going to get that particular, because most of the time we're all, you know, you guys probably do the same. I mean, we're all hunting one buck typically. And that sometimes is a, it's a tough thing to do. I mean, and I, I've been down those roads where it's like that deer or, n- or nothing. And, and, well, you remember and, it, and it's tough. We talked about, we talked about um, when we first, what they wanted me to, to do the store, get involved in that. I'm, I told them, I said, dude, you cannot expect six, seven bucks, all kinds of states out of me doing, I'm going to find one and, and I'm going to be done. I'm going to give you a kill for the year. So uh, that's where a lot of that came in where, you know, you get these, shows the guys are running around from different states or they're, you know they're shooting um subpar bucks and all of them just to get the footage and that because it's you know it's all about me i wanted to make that about our customers and the other thing we didn't mention before which i really feel um i've seen i've been around this industry for a lot of years there's guys that nobody knew about that have been hunting and i've seen some of the stuff they had on the walls and uh i mean these guys are some good some of the best hunters in the in, in the country that are just uh you know, there's there's these old farmers down in Illinois. Uh, these two old guys, two years in a row, shot the biggest um, shotgun kills for the year. They're walking around with their their racks that came in a score and had a good time. They ended up just tossing them in their garage. And they're, you know, I mean, they're just so there's some guys out there with some talents that. Um, and who's the next big talent? Who's the next young kid coming up that's gonna uh, take this thing and run with it? You know, so they're out there. Uh, might be one of your sons, uh, one of your daughters. Who knows? Well, Andre, I liked your point where you said, you know, it wasn't always about like quantity and, and like just kill shot footage, which I think is what people want to see nowadays is more that dialed in um, why you're doing what and really going in after something rather than just like a rapid fire, like right. killing in every state, um, which that is cool, too. And it has its place. But that's also what makes whitetail addictions what it is. Like if you can dive in to something deeper and a lot of guys that are wanting to do that um, on their own hunts can kind of look to you guys on how to, to, to dive deeper on a specific buck or how to figure out a property a better way. So it's a little more detailed and obviously whitetail focused where I think a lot of the other shows don't really give you the details or the right. in-depth. You know, they're at, they, the they go to an outfitter, they show the, the you know facilities, they get a free hunt, they get put on big deer. Our guys don't don't have all of that, so it's uh, they're on their own, doing their own deal, and it's it's more of a real a real scenario. And you talk about some guys step it up, you know. Um, if you're about score, you do that. If you're not, uh, some guys are about phenomenal just footage. Uh, Sam Rundy used to be, you know, he'd take a lesser caliber deer for a a phenomenal good show and some good footage. So uh, um, and Adam, you know, he's a big buck chaser so he's out for the biggest stuff you can find whether you got to go to alberta or iowa so all different types of guys different types of way to go about it but um and you'll see that in there you're going to see these are not everybody's cut from the same cloth so uh and you and see and i and i think i was like this when i kind of first especially when i first got into filming too at that time it was more about i was playing this i just want to stack them up you know if it was 130 plus man i was just i was i was killing it mm-hmm. and and i and you kind of play that a little while and you know early on and then after a while you're like oh, i don't want to shoot those 130s anymore i want to shoot some 140s and then it's 140s and then you just and you kind of slowly get you know and and step up your game all the time but um until you're typically hunting you know one or two deer and that and that's it um I, I will say that can suck too at times too but when you get really to that cool. point because yeah, really those deer are super hard to find, you know? So I can't wait to see the film where Kurt just literally pisses his pants, the biggest buckets like and screws up with camera, <laughs> and then it comes after me. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, I'm driving down right now. <laughs> you know what will happen? What it will be is if I set up and I'm like, ooh, I'm too scared to move the camera arm because this is my opportunity, you'll just hear the shot. Well, I'm, there's just some trees on film with some leaves, and you'll hear me go, hell yeah, and then that'll be it. And then I'll just have to – we'll have to do, like, a, a reenactment where we can get Cody. You know when you watch those, like, crime shows where it says, like, reenactment? We'll just have <laughs> Cody reenacting me <laughs> shooting a target or something. You know? and then so, do, you, do you remember the footage from the Wisconsin one? Uh, Justin, you hear a big bump in there? I go to fold draw too quick, and now the camera arm is not, it's not lined up, and, and I'm at draw. 
and you can hear me take my bow and literally bump that sucker over and get in screen and then smoke them, you know. So <laughs> we are, you know, we aren't all that skilled the guys, but uh, we do what we got to do to get it done, you know. So yep. I mean, that's what's also for me. I think a lot of people that are into self filming, when you know a show is ninety percent or more self filmed, it makes it really appealing. I mean. I know some hunting shows have that real cinematic type film to them, which is cool too. But just like I said earlier, like they have their time and their place and that one, that's what makes their show different than, than another show. But it's kind of cool to see working class guys, real dudes going like self filming. Nobody, they don't have a camera guy. So it's, well, it makes it yeah. that much more. So there are some, so some shows right We're after you, Justin, right? So to get you to go and come and film from, they wanted you, they actually wanted you to have, a guy filming you because they wanted yeah. quality, better footage, and you kind of told them, you know. I company. was talking. I was talking to some guys, and they wanted me to film for them and stuff like that. And they were like, basically, it was a deal breaker. They're like, you got to have a cameraman. I'm like, no way. I'm like, this is hard enough. I'm like, I don't want another person in the tree with me. I don't want another silhouette, more scent, more movement. I'm like, I'm good. I don't want that. Plus, that's my time. I like being out there by myself. Well, not to mention too, if. A lot of I don't know how about everybody's property, but mine, I have like exclusive permission on some of my pieces that are they're smaller pieces of property, and the farmer might be like, "Hey, you can hunt here, just be respectful, don't bring anybody with you. I just want you or you and your dad out here, and that's it." And you know, my dad's gonna hunt because he wants to to do his thing, and I want to do my thing too. And you know, if one of us is tagged out, we'll get together, or whatever. But a lot of times, I couldn't bring a camera guy with me even if I wanted to. Because I don't have permission to bring anybody else on the small farm oh, that I have permission on. So that's the reality for a lot of people, I think, or that's my experience at least. No, and, and I have places, just, you know, like that too. I can't bring anybody in there. Um, there, you know, th that'd be the quickest way to get me booted out for sure. And that's something probably that gets overlooked in the in the film game of the industry. But I mean, that just shows you it's a real working class type show. Everybody for the most part has day jobs and they're hustling, hunting and putting in the work in their free time. So I think that's even more appealing to a viewer. How about that first hunt, uh, Cody, that you filmed that nice buck where, uh, we got kind of almost sealed the deal. We got close to it. That that's playing now too. And I wanted to bump out and probably go chase some other deer and you took it upon yourself to snow. i um, dove in, grab a stand, went low, uh, literally, Shot a 160 class, and I don't know how you were pretty damn young back then too. Um, so you get you get caught up in this stuff, and it and it just it, it, it drives you to do do some crazy things and get uh, get aggressive. That's oh, that was the show that you had to wear blaze orange, and that you uh, I had to fight you with to put that vest on. I think <laughs> it, was during, it was during muzzleloader season. This young kid running around chasing him with bull, you know. So um, yeah, it, that was rewarding rewarding uh, for me um, to see you catch that all filmed yourself and. Yeah, it wasn't. It, it was not. It was not pretty by any means, and that was that was pretty much like set the camera up, hit record, and be like ready and just leave it there. But I don't know. It's weird when I started filming. There was all or not filming when I started hunting. That was like it was before white tail addictions. But you like must have bought a camera. I, I, don't, I just remember my introduction into hunting. Like cameras were were involved. Like because I'm not going back. Like. They were, you know, the old older cameras, but that, you know, around that time was when I really started getting serious into hunting. So it was kind of something I always wanted to do because it it was something that was a part of it. And then I, I don't know, I've, I've been so it's such a pain in the ass, you know. And it, it, there's so many times I'm like, <laughs> what, am I, what am I doing? <laughs> but late in the year, I'm just like, all right, all right, screw that. But I will say, like Justin says, like when when I go back, which is not very often, but it's, it's cool to have those, like to, to see and watch the footage. I mean, it's cool to sit around with buddies and stuff or whatever. And, and, um, so and the ones you don't have, you, here's something you'll probably be surprised of in all of this from the start of it. My favorite part of the show, I, you know, I, you probably, I've seen a lot of buck hit the ground. I've seen a lot of, uh, a lot of stuff in the real world and footage. My fascination with this whole deal was how these guys handled uh, their addictions and in the first like episode um that was for me that was the, that's the best part of the, the show you know you know 
some guys are, you know, buying their wife's flowers and catering them all year because they just know they're, they got a game plan on their head. I'm out of here in November. I'm taking that camera and I'm gone. And you've been down the road. He's, I've had a few buddies get divorced over this stuff that. Um, oh, I have too. <laughs> but I see the addiction or, you know, we see the uh, one good scene with Sean Bell. He's, uh, he was a cop. He's got the, um, what do you call it, the speed deal there. And he's, he's, he's shooting these cars going by and he says, this is what I do for a living. What I really like to do is hunt whitetail, you know. Or what about the two guys with recurves years ago that um, one guy worked in a psychiatric ward and he'd be on a, uh, on a balcony making pretend that he's, he's hunting deer. He's drawing his recurve on people that are yeah. walking by. I mean, if it wasn't a real recurve, but he's making pretend. And I'm, I'm looking at this rough footage. And I'm like, man, you guys, <laughs> I thought I was crazy. You guys are way out there. So um, that was a big, big deal for me. I used to love to watch that raw stuff. A lot of stuff that didn't end up on shows. I get to see you guys, you know, at, in that vulnerable state or, you know, <laughs> stumbling on uh, what you're talking about or, but um I can't wait to see the new stuff. I am. I'm really, really excited. To, uh, is it fair to say that Whitetail Addictions has probably put down some of the biggest deer? Like, I mean, if you go like percentage wise, you guys are killing some of the biggest deer of the of the oh, industry, yeah. right? Some flammers on them back episodes. I mean, uh, and stuff that didn't get killed. It was on um, some world class deer. So, um, if and it's weird. It just happened that way. You know, really, it wasn't. You know, it's. We're in our career. We start filming. And, you know, for me, I was always stepping up, stepping up. And I hit it in the peak of my, uh, um, you know, some like some young athlete in the, in the peak of his career. And right at when White Tail Addictions was coming, you know, I don't know if I could ever keep up to them standards in the, in the past, but it was like, um, it was crazy, man. It was just like, let's go. Um, Illinois, Especially. Wisconsin, back to four. Yeah. At that time, I think when the, when the episodes aired, it was, I remember being a kid, like, you know, selling those DVDs at like the hunting shows and people would look at it like we'd have the call outs on there. People would look at them like, oh, it's like a high fence hunting show because they'd see all the, the giant deer were like, no, no, this is, these are just regular guys. Like they're all hunting over to, oh, yeah, okay, whatever. There's, there's three deer over 200 inches on there. Well, yeah, like they're, you know, they, but it's, yeah, so there's, there's been some big stuff on them shows and, and collectively as a group, yeah, there's, if you took, this crew of guys and and looked at the walls they got. I mean, it's, it's, there's, there, there's no slouches there. And and this is, it's not just big farms. It's, it's guys hunting public land, guys hunting private land, big pieces, yeah. small pieces. Like how about, it's, you know. how about the one guy that made the statement that time? Uh, oh, look at that guy. There's, he's not that great of a shot of shooting all those deer at 15, 15 yards away. Self filming. <laughs> world-class deer, you know what I mean? Freaking thing doesn't know you're there. And that's the skill of it, not the, uh, to be able that's to pull really the shot. Get an animal that caliber yeah. on film with yourself. I mean, that steps the game to the next level. So it, it makes, uh, if you're, if you're out for a challenge and you're out to up your game, I mean, that's. And that's, and, and that's what's always been such a cool thing about it too, because like Cody was saying, you know, these guys, I mean, guys are shooting, you know, they're hunting, small little private pieces or you know some of the guys are you know hunting public or i shot my buck on five acres this year uh, you know sometimes hunting private is hard some pieces of privates hunt is harder to hunt than some public ground that we've all hunted before yeah. you, i that, mean you get on you get on the right piece i mean remember that piece i had monomany falls cody that it was 10 acres and 10 guys on it, it wasn't my one of my favorite spots i'd shoot some nice bucks on there but imagine hunting a 10 acre parcel with 10 other guys. I used to go to the Nicolay National Forest to get some peace and quiet. I go up to the National Forest there and run into nobody for a whole week, that public ground, and you come back to that suburban where they had some nicer bucks. And it was like a freaking zoo at that time. Guys were starting to all come from the, the north and hit the suburban stuff. So it was, there's a challenge in finding a piece uh, of uh, quiet ground, you know, just in the suburban area or, or on, on uh, private. So. Hey, let um, me ask this going going back to the show. How many episodes can can listeners and viewers expect to see this year? I think we should have ten to twelve. Awesome. Um, that's we're sitting on six right now, with probably at least five more to go. So and what you, is your, if, if someone's never watched the show? the old episodes or what's coming from the new episodes. How would you describe the format of an episode? 
we always like to start off with the front end of that, you know, that interview process of basically somebody, you know, just the average Joe, he's, he's talking about his life, what he does, whether he's got family, whatever. And he's basically explaining uh, how he deals with his, his, his addiction, you know, and how he's trying to, you know, balance everything in his life. But, and, and, and how he got to where he's at, you know, you know, from usually it's a lot of them are father figures that brought him into the sport. Uh, me, it was, you know, some, uh, a friend of mine's older brother mentor. Uh, my father didn't hunt much, but, uh, so there's a, there's a bunch of different stories. A lot of them though are probably grew up in a hunting household and her dad took him under wing and, um, and brought him to the next level. So. Yeah, typically once they, you know, we, we kind of go through that or whatever. And then we, you know, we dive into a little bit of like, you know, the routine maybe of how, you know, before season, you know, the things that they do or, and, and kind of the build up before, because almost every single one of these guys and every episode is hunting a particular deer. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, I know. Pass up the one you shot this year, like three, three years in a row. You've seen that deer or had, uh, yeah, I, yeah, that deer I've, I, I've, I have trail camp pictures of that deer three years, three years in a row, and then I passed him up uh, a couple times a couple years ago. So and that's how you, you know, that's how you get to where you get. You get, you know, get a nice big buck on the ground. And or, I guess what I'm curious plan? to know is when can someone expect to like see episodes, new episodes launching, or if someone just wanted to binge watch them all through, um, what what's the time frame looking like? Well, right now, right now we have all the old episodes that are on uh, the Lone Wolf Custom Gear YouTube page. And so the first uh, episode, the first new episode will launch uh, June 1st. Oh, cool. And June 1st will, will take us, basically, it will carry us all the way till um, opening day of bow season. Very so cool. we, can, we can kind of feed everybody else's addiction right up until season starts. Okay, I have a question. I don't even know if this is a possibility, so you guys can tell me to shut the hell up if you want. But if someone's watching or listening to this podcast and they're like, man, I kill pretty good big deer. I still film all my stuff. I might want to be a part of this. What can they do to reach out? Or is that even a possibility? Yeah, oh, absolutely. I mean, basically, that's how I started. Mm-hmm. You know, I reached out and you know, through a conversation or whatever. And then I filled out the application at the time and we have one on our Lone Wolf custom gear site. Um, it's kind of a, what would you call it, Cody? It's kind of a split between custom gear and addictions or like, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a, so it's a application you feel right. Yeah. It's a, it's a staff form. So, I mean, you know, to, to dive in on that, we, we open with, um, we're open for any submissions. You know, we want guys uh, reaching out to us, guys who are passionate about the sport, guys who are as addicted as um, everybody else on the crew. And, uh, you know, we're always looking for more people to add and, you know, see how they're, how they're Here's coping. A perfect, perfect example on uh, Facebook. I had a guy reach out to me, a big fan of Lone Wolf for years. I mean, just, he reminded me of you years ago, fired up. And he said, Oh, can I, how can I get involved? There's pro. And I told him there's a, go on there. There's a form to fill out. He went and looked at it and he basically didn't feel anything. I came back and says, I I have nothing really to put on that, that form. I haven't killed anything yet. I haven't even started filming. I says, go back and just fill the damn form out and put your name in there and, and put on there what you, what you want to do. This might, you know, this is one of those things again, that uh, I could see that guy's got uh, 10 times the uh, uh, passion for it than anybody else that supplied. And, he might be the next guy that just takes his and, thing and runs with it. And, and, and that guy's no different than, than what I was at that time right. starting out. I, you know, I, I only had a couple good bucks under my belt at that time. I mean, he could easily, you know, just start knocking them down, you know, year after year and being consistent with it and, and, the, and catching it on big, video. It's the biggest thing I like to stress, too, that I talk. I have guys come up to me at shows like, hey, you know, I'm interested in the white tail addictions thing. Um, but you know, I'm not, you know, like, or I, I, I don't only have bucks to this caliber. Like the, the caliber deer you have do not matter. This is about, it's about being addicted. It's about, you know, showing your process, how you cope with that. Uh, you know, guys who are, are get it done type guys, you know, uh, using, you know, hunting, 
hunting mobily, using the products as they were intended. And, and that's a big thing too that stemmed into it. We're not going to shy away from there, but I mean, the whole, the whole group originally was essentially people who were getting mobile with their tactics, uh, you know, by using lone wolf products. And, and it's like, you know, some of these guys are in Alabama. Some of these guys are in upstate New York and, and, you know, some guys are, so the caliber isn't everything, you know, it's not. Yeah. It's some areas just don't have the, uh, the size deer net. And, uh, well, uh, when we used to have contests for that years ago, uh, the guys that won the uh, first place were, were not the biggest bucks on some of them shows. Um, some of them shows were, you know, I did a lot of that judging on that. And, um, there was a lot of really good footage, uh, excitement, and realism to it, you know. So uh, it doesn't matter. Like I said, all walks of life. And then we talked about two average Joes. I got a lot of customers, too, that aren't average Joes. They're, <laughs> they're very wealthy uh, people. Some are, uh, you know, one customer is like uh, chief of police in the, in New York. They're all like we are. When we get their bow in our hand, head out the woods, we're like a bunch of kids and just, uh, just having fun with it. So enjoy it. Um, it's been a good life. Um, and I, and I look forward to this next, this next run. I think we're going to have some really good, good stuff coming our way. So, oh, you know what? The other thing we should mention, Cody, we're going to, with the pocket arm now, we are going to, and it doesn't matter, even if you're not going to have a whole show done on you, we are going to want, uh, we're going to set something up where you can submit footage. So if you go out with a cell camera or a small camera this year and you get a kill, we're going to want a two and a half minute, three minute clip. Uh, of your kill and you can submit it into it and we're going to do a big collage of all our customer base um, that aren't doing the whole full season type of things but uh, are using the products and some of their kills so I think that's going to be a, a nice little addition that's a great idea white tail addiction so I like it yeah because so. I we are you know it's about the everyday guy at the end of the day yeah. that's going out there and, and doing some you know doing some big Big things in the whitetail woods. That's that's what it is for sure. I'm looking forward to watching all the episodes. Uh, mainly, you know, I'm excited to see Chandler's. You know, he's jumped on this year, so that's gonna be cool. I mean, I'm biased because he's one of my good friends, but seeing the whole team success and um, just kind of, I think me watching it will get me excited to try and have an episode on there for the following year. So we'll see what happens. You know, and something I uh, a lot of guys I talk to about self filming. A lot of guys will say, oh, man, you know what, I, you know, the camera, it's cost me dear, and this and that or whatever. And I know a lot of people are going to disagree with me on this. That camera keeps me calm because I multitask at that point, and I'm not completely just watching this animal there. And I'm, I'm calculating my move, putting my camera in place, getting myself set up, and I don't watch this deer walk in the whole time and let myself get built up i does that that camera kind of keeps me calm and then i sh- so i did see some guys uh take the game camera and strap it on and do that whole 60 minute clip at three seconds and didn't have to worry about anything and got some pretty good footage you know there might be a a chance that in between that change and over you might not get the actual kill but uh, some pretty nice clear footage with uh, the whole you know it's a wide view so you get a uh you're getting the deer in there, and you're getting some shots. So um, Ryan Colby used a uh, he used his uh, trail camera this year and got his whole he got a shot and everything on uh, on there you go on that, so, on that's that a camera. Good idea for turkey hunting too. If you had like decoys, yeah. you could set them up between the decoys. We're gonna do that, <laughs> man. Yeah, right. Mike Grenier just did that. Some good footage, eh? Um, Very cool. Just hopefully a coyote doesn't steal your camera. Yeah, like it did Eric. That's, yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> But if it does, have it on video and look for it during shed season. Because <laughs> it'll still work. <laughs> it's crazy. No. Well, what do you think, guys? I thought it was cool to like hear the history of it, how it got going, Justin, how you got into it, and then what to expect this year, man. It's and what's cool about it is just this is the first year back. Year after year when when everybody kind of gets their system figured out as far as like filming all that goes, it's gonna get better and better every year. And then who's telling you know what's going to happen when people do submissions and you know there's some hidden gems out there that are probably join the team and so there's going to be some exciting stuff so i'm I oh am, absolutely you know what we don't have uh i'm hoping to get ashley back into it we do not have any women yet uh submitting for some footage and um i might have to put that out there a little uh yeah. shout out to the ladies to um 
Get some I'm reaching out I'll, because I know some I know some chicks that that get it done. So that'd well, be a good fit. That's all you have to do is uh, just film on out during shotgun season. You get some phenomenal footage for a show. <laughs> so you ought to start doing that. Actually, no, she goes out there and gets it done on her own by herself. I used to be the one to talk. I, I took my <laughs> wife one year bear hunting. She killed the biggest bear in camp, and then ever since then, I never allowed her to hunt again. So. <laughs> He, he actually he actually stopped bear hunting after that. He's like, yeah, I'm not. I'm not. Did his, fi- did his feelings get hurt about that? There's some more to that story. Not only did I stop bear hunting, <laughs> I kept her knocked up for the next four years, so she couldn't she couldn't get out more. <laughs> but yeah, she shot this monster uh, twenty plus inch. Um, I was giving her shit, you know, and uh, she said I had a. Uh, she smoked at that time. I had to put my cigarette out. Sm- Swallow my mouth of chips and put my book away before I shot the damn thing. I was so <laughs> so ticked off, you know. So, uh, so yeah, them girls will probably show us up, but it wouldn't be a bad idea to get um, some involved. And then, and kid too, Jared Odetti's kid uh, shot a, a buck on video last year, didn't he, with the Lobo? Yeah, yeah, he shot Jared his first along. his uh, first he shot his first buck ever with a bow, uh, and Jared filmed it, shot it with the Lobo. That's awesome. going to have some young, young youngsters coming up. Uh, uh, New generation and us old timers still hanging on on the other end. So, yeah, that's what'll happen. the The twins will be after it here soon. Cody, oh. imagine they're probably they're probably chomping at the bit already. <laughs> I can imagine them both ripping through here on like ninety uh, uh, Honda. <laughs> you know, you guys are in trouble, right? Oh, like with their, with their guns strapped across their back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my oh, there's there's going to be a lot of deer dying when they get rolling. My daughters are going to be pretty. Yeah, I was going to say, forget about the sons. It's coming quick. Your one daughter's four years old shooting the ball already. So, um, yeah, she's she's savage. I already got her uh, as a pack, so she doesn't tell dad where all the big shit is. I'm telling her about. Yeah, it. She, you know, she comes back. She comes back all the time, and or shed season. You know, they find the shed. I'm like, oh, where'd you get? You know, where'd you get? What do you mean? Where'd we go? I'm like, what? Where'd you guys go? I can't. <laughs> I can't tell you where we went. <laughs> I'm like, not, that she, not that she knows where they went, but she it's the fact that yeah, she's a secret spot, so yeah. That's actually really awesome. <laughs> yeah, she's she's like, Well you no, I mean it's no. weird. Uh, I went through all that, but a lot of the generation now, you younger guys coming up, they all got kids. You got well, Gert, you guys all got them young ones coming up and it's um yep. um it's funny to watch how you guys I, mean, I was there, so <laughs> I just left. I left my wife with them, but you guys seem to be a little nicer and, uh, you know, well, uh, I love, I just had, I just had my son out turkey hunting and yeah, it's, it's awesome. I love it. It definitely changes things. And my daughter's 11 months now and I'm lucky I have a cool wife. Like I got to go to Oregon, South Dakota and do as much white hunting as I wanted to do. So that's thank a big part of it, dude. huge part of success right there. For sure. 100%. That's a Until good that's a part of it right there. Yeah. Yeah. Does Sam hunt? Um, she has a bow. She's been hunting with me. She's had two opportunities to shoot a deer. Um, and they just didn't pan out. It was like one of those, she'd be at full draw and I wanted it perfect, like broadside. Yeah. And then the deer had quarter too. So I'd be like, yeah, let's wait. So, but, and and then she kind of got to the point where she's like, I think I want to just shoot archery and maybe not kill stuff. I'm like, Hey, I can respect that, you know? Um, but lately she's been showing some interest in chasing turkeys with a bow. So I think next spring, we're going to get her a turkey tag. And then I probably won't even hunt up. My goal will probably be to just get her a turkey and yeah. um, do it that way. I mean, to me, a bird's a bird, but it'd be cool to see her kill a turkey. Oh yeah. Yeah. It, it's fun, man. That's how, that's how uh, my wife got into it was the turkey hunt. And we, and she shot a bow for a little while, but she was like, nah, screw this bow. And she like, <laughs> she wanted to shotgun hunt. So, um, <laughs> pretty, yeah. pretty, pretty lethal with shotgun. I'll say that. Yeah. Yeah. The, the turkeys is a, the turkeys is the gateway, man. I I, I encourage a lot of gateway to Yeah, we're interactive. Yeah, well, and just get out there. I mean, the process of hunting, going after something. She left me behind last year, shotgun season. She was like, she was I don't know, four months pregnant, or she was pretty big, and she went out by herself. I'm like, no, I better go out with you. You won't, you won't know what to do. She comes back and she's like, I shot Big John, and Big John's like this. Tank eight and run around that <laughs> nobody can kill. I, I told you, uh, Justin, I failed. I almost I wanted to, I was going to go kill that deer the second to last day of the season, get him the hell off this property. I had three guys coming here trying to take that big bully out of here. I said, screw it, I'm going in. And that son of a bitch kicked my ass in that woodlot over there. 
and she killed it that year. So <laughs> she was the only one I could get it done. So that's <laughs> yeah. funny. That's crazy. She went out there by herself four months pregnant and shot that deer. Oh yeah, it's pretty awesome. That's awesome, man. Something. Yeah, so that's 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 she finally now. became a DeQuisto. Was that like her initiation? Yeah. Involved in that would be nice. So. Uh, that's awesome. Hey, pro tip: get a good wife, and you can do as much hunting as you want. So that's right. Behind every successful guy is a, a good woman. So. All right. Well, I can feel I can feel the episode tapering. So I'm going to close it out in working glass style, and I'll just say, "Go shoot your bow," because I know Cody will ask me to howl like he does every episode. So yeah, go work for it, man. Uh, tune in next time. Thanks a lot, Justin, for taking some time. Hey, uh, thanks for having me on. For you, it. the stuff that wouldn't be coming back, man. We appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, well, Justin. We're, we're right. gonna make it good. We're gonna make it even better next year. Awesome. <laughs> oh, also, real quick before we close it out, if you do apply and your application gets accepted, you have to beat Cody in an arm wrestling match, and then you can be on the show. So that's how, that's the stepping stone. So good luck to you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks, guys. Uh,